Hello, and welcome to our Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is Season 2, Episode 8, Techno Thrillers. So, I talked about this topic some back in Episode 40 about Michael Crichton, since he is considered by many to be the father of the modern techno thriller. But I thought it was worth doing a full episode about it, because despite being a subgenre already, techno thrillers are a fairly broad and fuzzy branch of fiction that some authors further divide into subcategories of its own. I alluded to this in the teaser last episode when I said that techno thrillers are a genre bending category. They lie at the intersection of science fiction, the tales of the unreal and futuristic that we've been talking about this whole time, and thrillers, which themselves are not exactly a sharply defined genre and more a style of suspenseful, action-oriented stories, which at their best include things like the works of Alfred Hitchcock in film, but at their worst comprise a large raft of derivative airport novels. And in fact, Michael Crichton and Stephen King are themselves listed by Wikipedia as authors of airport novels. Derivative is a relative term, okay? More importantly, as you probably know if you're listening to this podcast, both of them have particular styles that are deeper than just ordinary thrillers. And that's part of what distinguishes techno-thrillers from thrillers in general. Techno-thrillers are, broadly speaking, thriller stories with sci-fi elements. Jurassic Park is a thriller story where people are cloning dinosaurs, a very sci-fi premise. The Andromeda Strain, said by many to be the first techno-thriller as we know it, is a thriller with dangerous alien lifeforms involved. But this isn't always what the word means. It can also mean thrillers that have a special focus on the technical details of the story, which rivals the hardest of hard sci-fi. They're often not traditional sci-fi with aliens or whatever, but instead explore the bleeding edge of real-life technology, or at least proposed or prototyped technology. These are the 20 minutes into the future fiction stories that don't include anything that's really impossible today. Tom Clancy's The Hunt for Red October is sort of the prototype for this kind of story. The only really sci-fi element there is Red October's stealth submarine engine system, and that kind of drive had been modeled and prototyped already, just not used in a production vehicle. It turns out to be really inefficient. Other than that, it was pretty much just an ordinary thriller. And this highlights the point I made at the start. There are different kinds of techno-thrillers, some of which are much more obviously sci-fi than others. Now, I have to admit up front, I have not read very many techno-thrillers. I don't have a lot of first-hand knowledge of them, and the ones I have read tend to be written by Michael Crichton, so I've already covered those, but they're not exactly a broad sample. So, for this episode, I'm mainly going to give some background and do a quick survey of the different subcategories of techno-thrillers and how they fit into sci-fi. I'm relying heavily on Sam Bush's article in Writer's Digest describing the different kinds of techno-thrillers. Bush is a techno-thriller writer himself, author of All Systems Down, so I think I can be confident that he knows more about this than I do. I've linked his article in the description, but this is one of those areas where you'll want to research the subject for yourself if you're interested. First off, let's take a look at the origin of the thriller genre. And here it goes back a long way. According to Wikipedia, thrillers in general use narrative techniques that date back to antiquity. The article name drops Gilgamesh, The Odyssey, Mahabharata, and 1001 Nights. Ancient stories often made use of standard tropes like plot twists, cliffhangers, red herrings, and unreliable narrators that are hallmarks of the thriller genre. For example, 1001 Nights, also known as the Arabian Nights, is famous for using cliffhangers as an internal plot device to keep Scheherazade alive to finish the story the next night. From what I've read, it apparently varies by version and translation, just how they're used. I don't think there was ever really a definitive version of the work in the way we're used to thinking about literature in the Anglosphere. Like, imagine if people kept adding stories to the Canterbury Tales over the centuries until they reached the planned number of 120. And then, somebody in China added retellings of a couple of Shakespeare plays that had become popular over there just for good measure. The two most famous stories in 1001 Nights, Aladdin and Alibaba, are not in the original. But I digress. The point is, 1001 Nights makes great use of cliffhangers. It also frequently has the evil vizier double-cross the sultan like Jafar did. At least one story is a proper murder mystery. 
A lot of old stories used similar literary devices to modern thrillers, presumably because they just make for good stories. In modern literature, the Wikipedia article first cites the Count of Monte Cristo from 1844. Now, of course, the Count of Monte Cristo is not sci-fi. For that, see The Star's My Destination. Oddly enough, that book I didn't see as particularly thriller-esque when I read it, although I can see the parallels in retrospect. Anyway, techno-thrillers are a more modern innovation. As I discussed at the beginning of Season 1, sci-fi was still being developed throughout the 19th century, and techno-thrillers arguably had to wait at least for Jules Verne and the rigorous description of technology he used in his stories, and really for sci-fi in general, especially hard sci-fi, to be developed in the early 20th century. But among techno-thrillers in particular, there are some early precursors before the Andromeda strain. For one, apparently a lot of pre-World War II and early Cold War Soviet science fiction was in the techno-thriller style. Then, in the Anglosphere, there's Alastair MacLean's 1962 novel The Satan Bug, in which a self-described environmentalist steals a biological weapon capable of wiping out all human life on Earth in protest of the laboratory that created it, except it's actually a ruse done for more selfish reasons. A bioweapon capable of wiping out all human life on Earth is definitely a science fiction concept, especially by 1960s standards before we had genetic engineering. Also with a healthy dose of, why did we even make this? But the two novels that are widely considered to have codified the modern techno-thriller are Michael Crichton's The Andromeda Strain in 1969, and Tom Clancy's The Hunt for Red October in 1984. I talked about the Andromeda strain in the Michael Crichton episode, and it is one of the more overtly sci-fi techno-thrillers out there. Briefly, it involves a mysterious disease brought down from space by an experiment gone wrong, which rapidly kills almost everyone it comes in contact with. And to fight it, a group of scientists are recruited into a futuristic bio-laboratory slash bunker, complete with nuclear kill switch, to figure out just what Andromeda is and how to stop it. Meanwhile, The Hunt for Red October, of course, was the debut novel of big-time thriller writer Tom Clancy. And, as I said before, it's much less sci-fi and more just techno. The premise is that Marco Ramius, captain of the Soviet Union's new stealth nuclear submarine Red October, wants to defect to the United States. He uses his stealth engine to escape Soviet waters and make a break for NATO, but he still has to deal with patrols on both sides. Meanwhile, CIA agent Jack Ryan puts the pieces together that Ramius plans to defect, and he has to convince the American and British navies to help him get through safely. What made The Hunt for Red October a techno-thriller was Clancy's extensive research and meticulous description of submarine warfare to the point where even then-Navy Secretary John Lehman was surprised at how accurate the book was, and it soon became recommended reading at the Naval Academy. Clancy worked hard on the technical details, and, like Jules Verne, wrote a story of cutting-edge technology that was possible but hadn't been done yet. Indeed, while Verne didn't write thrillers, his description of his books as Roman de la Science could be fairly translated into English as techno-novels. A lot of the same threads are there. I highlight these two stories as endpoints of what a techno-thriller can be, from Tom Clancy's cutting-edge but mundane technology, to stories that are both a little more futuristic and also deal with an outside-context problem like the Andromeda strain. Put this way, it feels like more of a spectrum than a genre in its own right, all the way from ordinary thrillers to full-blown science fiction like, say, Neuromancer. However, Sam Bush's subcategories of techno-thrillers run crosswise to that spectrum. Not entirely, there will be specific trends in each subcategory regarding how science fiction-y it is or isn't, but other than the last one, that isn't how they're defined. The definitions are much more about theme and setting. First on his list are the military techno-thrillers. This is the category to which The Hunt for Red October belongs and is probably closest to the traditional thriller. A cutting-edge military story doesn't necessarily need futuristic technology. The military is always going to have the best, and some of the things they have today already seem pretty futuristic. Just watch the news if you don't believe me. For an example of this type of thriller, 
Bush lists Dale Brown, not Dan Brown, but Dale Brown, and his stories based on his experience as an Air Force pilot. Next, there are the spy techno-thrillers. If there's anybody you expect to have fancier toys than the U.S. military, it's spies. The classic example of this may actually be in film, with James Bond and all his futuristic gadgets given to him by Q. But for a prose example, Bush cites Alex Berenson, author of The Faithful Spy. His third category are the crypto-techno-thrillers. Or I might actually call them cyber-techno-thrillers, which is a bit broader. These are stories where a lot of the action happens in the digital realm, with computer hacking pitted against the latest and greatest encryption. Bush lists several examples here. Daniel Suarez's Demon, spelled D-A-E, and Freedom, T-M. Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon. And Dan Brown's first novel, Digital Fortress. So, Digital Fortress is an interesting one to me. I talked about Michael Crichton, But there is one other author of techno-thrillers that I've read quite a bit of, and that's Dan Brown. I've actually read all of his books except for Origin. I just felt insulted by Inferno, so I didn't bother with Origin. Long story, I reviewed Inferno on my blog, so you can look for it there. Anyway, Dan Brown may be best known for his symbologist Robert Langdon and The Da Vinci Code, which is much more of a traditional thriller. But several of his books... In fact, most of them, when you think about it, are techno-thrillers. Antimatter, anyone? And this is especially true of his two non-Robert Langdon books, Digital Fortress in 1998 and Deception Point in 2001. Digital Fortress is very much a crypto-techno-thriller, even though Brown does include a fair bit of art history from Spain. This is a book that you might be surprised to learn was written before 9-11, but not at all surprised to learn was written before the NSA spying scandal broke in 2013. It's about the NSA, and it portrays them not as the heroes, per se, but probably better than the alternative. They aren't reading everyone's emails in the story, but they can read anyone's emails thanks to their fancy new 1998 supercomputer that can decrypt any kind of code used at the time and the heroes have to stop the bad guys from getting hold of what they think is an unbreakable encryption algorithm, which will cripple the NSA's anti-terror mission. Like I said, very pre-spying scandal. But this is the first of many instances where Dan Brown did not do the research. He seemed to think that a 128-bit key will only take twice as long to crack as a 64-bit key, which... If that were true, meaningful encryption anywhere would have become basically impossible by about 2007. And he doesn't do much better elsewhere, either. Brown is fond of putting a note in his books that reads, All of the technology described here really exists. The trouble is, oftentimes that's only true if it's followed by the words, On paper. And even then, he sometimes clearly misunderstands the paper, the bit about key length only being the most obvious example. Anyway, I haven't read Cryptonomicon or Demon, but I like both Stevenson and Suarez as writers, so I'll recommend starting there for crypto-techno-thrillers. After this, the fourth category on Bush's list is the disaster-techno-thriller. This isn't just a natural disaster. By his definition, the disaster can be a war. It's just not a military story. Interestingly, Bush lists his own All Systems Down, which is about a cyber war in this category, as well as Boyd Morrison's Typhoon Fury. And because of that, I feel like I don't have a great idea of what he means by this category. A priori, I think it could very easily overlap with your standard disaster story. It seems like a disaster techno-thriller should be more than a pure survival story more about the technical details of the disaster, or how the protagonists survive it. But in a lot of disaster movies, you'll see just that. There's at least one expert to explain what's going on. A climatologist in The Day After Tomorrow, a seismologist in San Andreas, that sort of thing. So I feel like this is something that would cut crosswise to disaster stories as well. Contrast something like Cloverfield, which is found footage, and is about the ordinary people you normally see running and screaming in the background, who don't have any idea what's going on and are just trying to survive. But I don't know how common it is to have a disaster movie or book for that matter without an expert. 
I think I would need to be a lot deeper into disaster stories in particular to analyze that question properly. If you have any further insights, leave a comment. And finally, we have the sci-fi techno-thrillers. These include the Andromeda Strain, where something otherworldly like space aliens is involved, but more often, they're stories that center technology that doesn't exist yet, but may in the near future. The classic example is Jurassic Park, which is focused on the then purely theoretical technology of cloning extinct animals. But here is where I really start to wonder. Sam Bush also includes The Martian in this category, which... kind of? It's not really action-y. It's suspenseful, but it's slower paced than your typical thriller. And I wouldn't say it has plot twists so much as reversals of fortune. Maybe I'm just being too picky there, but I would call it a survival story and not a thriller. But maybe you'll have a different opinion. Regardless, anything like Michael Crichton's later stories, where it's all about technology gone awry, would definitely qualify for sci-fi techno-thrillers. I don't know how useful all this has been to you. It's really just a quick survey of the subgenre. Maybe I'll do an interview later to get more at the meat of it, but I hope that this has at least improved your perspective and understanding of techno-thrillers a bit, and given you a clue about what to watch for. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is hosted by Libsyn and is very likely available wherever you prefer to listen to podcasts. You can find me on YouTube at Science Meets Fiction, on Twitter at Sci Meets Fiction, and my website, sciencemeetsfiction.com. Now, I need a book recommendation, but like I said before, I've already covered Michael Crichton, and I haven't read a lot of other techno-thrillers. I actually really liked Deception Point when I first read it, but I'm hesitant to recommend anything by Dan Brown looking back. However, I do have one book that I can confidently recommend, Delta V by Daniel Suarez. It's a bit of an edge case because I didn't think of it as a techno-thriller when I read it, but it is by the same author as Demon, and I can see a lot of the thriller tropes looking back. Maybe I just haven't been on the lookout for that kind of thing. Unlike Demon, though, Delta V is not a crypto-techno-thriller, but is solidly in the sci-fi techno-thriller category, as it's all about space travel. Long story short, it's about an eccentric billionaire who wants to start really making money off of space travel and builds a secret asteroid mining mission to get it started before the lawyers, or major governments, can stop him. He recruits James Ty, an experienced technical diver, as part of the mission. And now that I think about it, Ty sounds a lot like a typical techno-thriller protagonist. Adventure-loving, has lots of experience relevant to the mission, but comes at it from a different angle and is able to outsmart the bad guys because of it. And yes, of course there are bad guys, even in space. So yeah, it's not perfect, but it's a pretty good techno-thriller. I reviewed the book on my blog if you want to know more. Link in the description. Also, the sequel, Critical Mass, comes out next January. The next episode will be a special horror-themed catch-up episode to kick off October. And like the first one of these, I will be covering one old and one new property that I didn't get to in Season 1. John Wyndham's The Midwich Cuckoos, better known as Village of the Damned, and Jordan Peele's newest sci-fi horror, Nope. Thanks for listening.